pulpit to hide behind. So you see all of me. All right, we're going to start with to God be the glory. Amen. Let's stand together. One more song, How Great Thou Art. What a great song to sing together as a big church this morning.
praise the Lord. that ladies well, we're going to have a interesting session I think this uh, this morning and again appreciate you all coming and being part of our, our conference and um, just uh, a few people have been been saying how you know how, how much they've enjoyed being at, at conference and just saying you know just thanks for putting this on I want to tell you that um, this was the heart of our church coming into to pastoring here, I tried to meet up with, with our church members just to get to know them, and I asked them, what's, what's the one thing you want to keep on the calendar? And they all said leadership conference. And their heart is that they just want to be a blessing to you. And so I appreciate our church, and I appreciate how they've uh, already worked so hard. Um, I just get to come for the ride, all right? So, but this morning, uh, we're going to we're going to, um, if you men, if you could come up. We've got Brother uh, Michael Adams and Brother Seth, Seth Hort, and they uh, minister alongside uh, Dr. David Gibbs, who has been part of our conference a number of times over the years. And of course, uh, the ministry there is Christian Law Association. And uh, I think it, it just would be good for us this, um, this, this morning just to sort of hear what's, what's been happening on the on the. Uh, state side of things, just with, again, some of, the, some of the governmental things, some of the legal things that have been coming up as far as churches are concerned. And if you know, you've probably seen that Roe versus Wade has been overturned over there and some of that. And I think, I think there's going to be some implications for us as, as God's people here. And often what happens over there eventually finds its way um, on our side of the, of the world. And I think it's, it's good for us to sort of think and prepare. There's wisdom in that, right, church? There's wisdom in that. And so just listening in, and then uh, if we have, do have a bit of time, then we can, we can um, take a, a few questions at the end. Um, but I mentioned Dr. Gibbs, and he's always been a big part of our conference. And um, uh, obviously he's not here, and we miss him. 
and we, we were hoping he was going to be here, but we understand and we've certainly been praying for him uh, and his representation over there in a very important case, which I'll let the, the men tell you about if they can. But we do have a video, um, uh, another church prepared of, uh, of one of Dr. Gibbs's many, many stories. And we love, we love Dr. Gibbs's stories, right? And, um, and so we're just going to show that. And then if I could, men, if you could um, introduce yourselves and, and just uh, so that we can get to know you. All right, so we'll play the video first. Thanks. I was in Alaska doing a lawsuit. We're way out in the Aleutian Islands, getting ready to leave and go back to Anchorage and then home. And I had a ticket in my pocket to get on an airplane. And a pastor came up and he said, listen, I can save you money. I said, how's that? He said, I flew a small airplane up here and I fly a small airplane and I can take you in my little airplane and you can save your ticket. And this did not sound, I said, gee, thank you so very, very much, but I've got this ticket. We'll just make our way on home, me and this other lawyer with me. He said, no, 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 you gotta do it, you gotta do it. And against every better judgment I had, I said, okay. Well, we went out to the airport, took us by his little plane and I looked at it and I thought, well, one good thing, it's shiny. Then he walked around it. <laughs> we got in. He's on the left front. I'm on the right front. The other lawyer's sitting right behind me. And he started it up. And it started up just fine. Well, we taxied out. I said, should we pray? He said, yeah, that's a good idea. We normally don't. I said, well, this time we're going <laughs> to. And I'm telling you, I prayed five, eight minutes. I prayed a long time. We went and got on the runway. He starts down the runway. The plane lifted off ever so gently and we start climbing. And it's wonderful. Not a problem in the world. We started climbing and we flew probably three, four minutes. And something happened that will never leave my mind. The pilot turned to me and he said, we're going in the clouds and I can't fly in clouds. They make me pass out. I said, clouds make you do what? Now, it's been cloudy all day. And we go right up into the clouds, and you can't see anything. And he looks at me, and his eyes roll back in his head. And he starts mumbling, and he passes out. Passed out cold. Now, I grabbed him, and I shook him, and I said, come on, you got to wake up so I can kill you. Now, we're in the clouds, flying along with no pilot. And my friend in the back seat said, we're dead, aren't we? I said, there's a very good chance of that, yes. He said, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know. But there was a radio right there, and I handed him the microphone, and I said, start asking for help. So he's in the back seat reaching up, and he said, hello, hello. We didn't know any proper radio etiquette. All we were saying was hello. And somebody answered back, hello, hello. Don't you guys know proper radio etiquette? And I said, give it to me. I said, tell we don't know nothing. Tell him we're in an airplane with a passed out pilot and we don't know how to fly this plane. The guy said, I'm a freighter flying out of Anchorage on the way to Tokyo. And he said, you're telling me you have nobody who can fly that plane with you? I said, tell him that's correct. Now you gotta understand, I am sweating bullets. He said, the first thing I'm gonna do is start circling so I don't lose you because I'll fly out of range of your radio and you won't have me anymore. And he said, I'm gonna get Anchorage emergency for you. An Anchorage emergency will be the people that can maybe help you try to save your life. After about five minutes, Anchorage came on, said, we understand you have a passed out pilot. And those of you do not know how to fly that plane. We said, that's right. They said, well, the first thing we got to do is find you. And I'll never forget what this man at Anchorage said. He said, my job is to get you home safe. He said, that's my job. But he said, here's the deal. If you want me to get you home safe, you got to promise me you'll obey my voice. He said, you can't see me, but I can see you. And he said, if you're not going to obey my voice, you're going to die. When you can't see anything, you have no idea how disorientated you become. Finally, he said, okay, I found you. Now hear me clear. He said, you're four minutes from a mountain. He said, you're going to crash in that mountain and die. Follow my voice. I never said, I have to follow your voice. Is that reasonable? You see, I understood without his voice, I had nothing. And do you understand, without God's voice, you have nothing. Nothing. Finally, he got us turned. And he said, I'm freezing all the traffic in the area. 
He said, it's going to take me an hour and a half to get you to Anchorage and there's a lot of weather between you and Anchorage. You're in for a rough ride. And he said, I want you to hear me. I don't want you to look at what's going on outside. I don't want you to pay attention to the storm, just my voice. He said, if you start watching the storm, you will die. But I'll take you through it. Now, because they cleared all the traffic, several pilots, those nighttime freighters, those 747s started talking to us. They said, we're praying for you, men. You're going to make it. But listen to the voice. That's the key. They said, trust the voice. You realize your head is full of voices and everybody in this world wants to talk to you and everybody wants to be the controlling voice. And God says, I want you to be a living sacrifice. I want you to put yourself on the altar and let my voice be your voice. Finally, we went through the worst of the weather, but there was still more. And then the voice came back and it said, now, I'm gonna line you up. He said, I'm gonna bring you in right down the runway. And at the foot of the runway are some lights and they're in the form of a cross. He said, don't you forget this. The cross is the way home. Finally, he's bringing us down. We still can't see anything. And all he kept saying is, stay with me. My sheep, the Bible says, hear my voice and they follow me. Finally, just a couple hundred feet off the ground, we saw the cross. I landed the plane. In fact, I landed it seven times. Finally, it all came to a stop. And the minute we stopped, the pilot woke up. The voice said, thanks for listening. I watch them crash and burn all the time because they won't follow my voice. They don't understand I'm the one who can see them even when they can't see me. But they get the voices in their head and they kill themselves. They self-destruct. Thanks for listening to the voice. Then they put us in a motel room at about four in the morning. The knock at my door. And I opened the door and a man was standing there, he said, hello, David. I said, you're the voice. You're the one who got me home. He said, I am. Do you understand one day you're gonna stand before him and say, you were the voice. You're the voice that brought me home. If you're not on that altar as a living sacrifice, your head's full of voices. And then we wonder why kids crash and burn. We wonder why marriages are shattered. And the Lord's saying, I'm the one who has the voice. All I can remember is that voice saying, stay with me. Stay with me. Don't listen to what's going on in your head and don't watch the storm. Stay with me. And I'll take you through. Tonight you have a God who has promised to take you through. A living sacrifice, holy. Oh. All right. I feel like we need to have an invitation. <laughs> uh, well, what a story. And obviously they survived. And uh, were you, was it one of you men in there or? It wasn't, no. it wasn't us, it was a few years back. Okay. All right. It was back when they had less regulations on airplanes. <laughs> he doesn't tell the end of that story. He forgot to tell his wife. He didn't want to worry her, so he didn't tell his wife about it. Mm. And later she got a call from the FAA at home saying, are you Mrs. Gibbs? Is your husband the one who was in the airplane crash in Alaska? Oh. She says, no, it wasn't my husband. He would have told me. <laughs> and so he, he got it when he got home. Yeah. <laughs> Man, if you could uh, introduce yourself. Um, I'm Michael Adams. I'm a legal missionary with the Christian Law Association, and I've been with the ministry now 17 years this year. And yeah. it's a privilege and an honor. It's the high honor of my life to be a legal missionary. And this is Seth Hott. Seth, introduce Yeah, I'm Seth Hott. I've been with, mission with the uh, Christian Law Association now for going on 10 years, if you don't count when I worked with them when I was in school, just as a homeschool kid. Uh, Brother Gibbs said he wanted to do some work for us, and I had the opportunity to work with him then. And so... I've now been with them 10 years in my adult life and traveling with Brother Gibbs. Amen. 
So no doubt you've seen a, a couple of things over the years. We have. And uh, we're glad that we can, we can have you as part of our conference. And uh, welcome to Australia as well. Thank you so First much. time here. And we put the best weather out for you, but <laughs> no, it gets better. But um, we're glad for, for just your, your work. And, um, you know, we've often observed what's happening in the, in the States. And obviously, at times, even concerned about what's been happening. And, you know, you look at the world around us and you see stability crumbling. And we, wanna, we wanted to just sort of dig in a little bit about that. And I wanted to start with probably one that we've all obviously gone through, and that's COVID. And it really has this whole, whole time, this, this period, it's not only paused everything that we've normally been able to do, but it's had, I think, some different implications. And I wanted to get your thoughts on that as far as what you've observed on, on that side of the world. What kind of implications has that has that had towards churches and, and Christianity in general, in your observation? Sure. Um, COVID was an unusual event that happened, and it affected all of our churches. In fact, it affected all around the world. And um, there were actually three main thoughts during the COVID pattern, and hopefully we're out of it now. We're still seeing cases here and mm. there. In fact, uh, two men in our office this last week came down with COVID, and mm. Uh, so pray for them if you would. Uh, um, the first argument that in California they were making, and there were three main arguments about COVID. Number one, we ought to have the churches open, and this is America that I'm explaining, so it may be a little different, mm -hmm. but for freedom's sake. We in America have the right to have churches open because of freedom. Um, we have the freedom to do many different things, and that's what a lot of people were gung-ho saying, we have the freedom to have our churches open. And so that was the first argument. There were um, attorneys and good attorneys uh, arguing that in California. Some of the Catholic attorneys, you may have seen some of that in the news. And Seth, go ahead and tell them the second thing. The second one was just out of fairness. If Walmart across the street or um, pot shops, um, Sam's Club is open, then churches should be allowed to be open as well. And then the third one, which is where our stance would be, is that we have a biblical mandate. We would say that it is a sin for us not to have church. And that's where we came in, and that's where we, we were defending with Brother Gibbs and the other attorneys. Brother Gibbs would tell you this, and I've heard him say it many, many times. If we don't have a biblical mandate to have church, then why in countries where they can be put to death or imprisoned do they go to church? Why would they go? It's because the Bible says that we're to gather together. We're to edify one another. We're to have church. And so our argument was, and a lot of the attorneys who were on the Catholic side that we were working with through this process couldn't understand what we were saying because they only went to church a couple of times a year themselves. Yeah. And so when we say, no, our churches are faithful. Every week we go, anytime the doors are open, well, they didn't quite understand that. However, a judge in North Carolina, and this was a, a huge blessing. I'm from North Carolina, so if you hear I'm from the southern United States, if you hear my voice a little bit drawl sometimes, that's why. Now, Seth's from the north, and I'll forgive him for that. <laughs> um, in North Carolina, we represented a church and a group that wanted to stay open. They wanted to stay open. They were following procedures. They were doing everything just right, had sanitation, but they wanted to use the property because why do we have church properties if we don't use them? Hmm. We put all these money into it. We put all these great facilities together to minister. It's a part of our ministry when you're at church. So we went before a judge and the judge said, we started to talk. We started to say, okay, judge, here's what we want to do. And the judge, before we were able to stop, said, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me get this straight. You're saying you don't think that your local government should tell you you can't have church. We said, that's right. He said, so you think you should have church because your Bible says so. We said, absolutely. And at this point, when a judge is rolling on your side, you just stay quiet because, you know, he's, he's helping you out. And so he went through three or four more things. We stood there for about 15, 20 minutes just waiting and waiting, saying, yes, judge, yes, judge, yes, your honor. Finally, he turns to the other side and says, you don't believe that? And he, you should have seen the deer in the headlights look they had. 
at the end of that event, he had not only opened up the churches in North Carolina, but in that whole region, and it spread through the rest of the country. So we just praise the Lord for his efforts in that. That is prayer. That is God doing it. Because we go in with what we have. But when we go in with what he has, it makes all the difference. All the difference. In fact, right now, and this is why Brother Gibbs can't be here, we're still seeing the after effects of COVID in our, in our country. He's actually preparing to argue a case in the Third Circuit Court of Appeals because there are churches in New Jersey and on the New England side, which in America, what happens in California goes to the rest of the country and what happens in New England goes to the rest of the country. And right now, Brother Charlie Clark and several others, um, they have asked us to help them and Brother Gibbs will be personally arguing the case to make sure the government cannot just criminally charge pastors for opening church. And so pray for him, if you would. That is essential. We've tried for many, many months over the last few years to get the president. We had many meetings with Vice President Mike Pence during that time, asking, please say, please state from the government, state from the federal government that churches are essential and they just wouldn't quite do that. So pray that they will. Pray that they'll say church is essential. As Seth said, they were allowing all kinds of other shops, stores, everything else open, and they weren't allowing churches. And so keep praying for that. Another thing with those churches as well is the people, the members, the people that were attending churches were being handed citations when they were walking into these churches. Wow. So, I mean, imagine if you walked in that back door and they're going to hand you, if you come inside this building, it's a $500 citation. Mm. And the people stood, and now we've worked with those kind of things, but that's Brother Clark's church and these other churches. It's not just the pastors that dealt with this. These were the people, the churches, the people that worked so hard for this. They were willing to face a $500 charge and ongoing fees for every per service time. that you met per mm. service. Right. And that's the people, not just the facility, not just the pastors. And the, the churches church. were being fined as well. You may have seen that on the news in California, New England, and some of the southern states even, which we were very shocked about. They were having sheriffs come around and ticket cars, take down license plates, note, it, note who was going to church when they shouldn't be going to church. Now, I don't know about you, that's never happened in America before. Yeah. Not ever. And so we saw very much our government overreach with governors, local mayors, especially sheriffs, who just realized they had the power then to, to control things. And when that starts to happen, it's a very slippery slope. That's why we are staying there and helping the Clarks and these others mm. say, no, we need to fight back against that so we can have church the way God's called us to have church. Mm. And I guess that's what we wrestled with as, as well, right, as churches over here. You know, in the initial stages, we didn't know what COVID was about and, and what, it, what it all was. And it was almost like there was no option for us to sort of even appeal some of those mandates. And so I know many of our churches just obeyed those mandates to begin with. But the more we found out about COVID and all of that, it just didn't make sense in a way. And, and, and I know it's different in, in, even in our relationship as Aussies with government and so forth. But... Um, I know that, that hearing those stories, I'm not sure how many of our churches experienced that. Um, our church in Sydney, about, the, about a month or two into this whole time, we actually had um, some police driving around and observing those that came onto property. And we had, just, we had the live stream team there at that point, and, um, and it parked across the road from us on, uh, on, the, on the backside, Alice Street. And so I was the only one left. Um, everyone else had gone. So I just went up to the, to the policeman and I just asked, just in case I was suspecting something that wasn't there. And I just knocked on his window and I said, oh, excuse me, officer, were you here observing our church? And he said, yes. And at that point, you know, you just saw the seriousness of it in the sense of, we have to stand for this. And um, you, you mentioned there some of the... Some of the um, there's some lingering effects that have remained. Mm -hmm. Can you talk us through what those are um, currently? Sure. Number one, the government overreach hasn't stopped. And that's why we're still fighting that. Whenever government takes a little bit extra, a little bit extra, they usually do it in the name of health and safety or security. Health and safety 
was the key during COVID. And we're the people who believe in government powers. We believe in, in the police. We believe in law enforcement. We pray for them. We host days that, that tell them how much we love them and we care about them and we want them to have the best that they can have. And we want to share the gospel with these folks. So when health and safety comes around, when there's a virus like this, they're looking for someone. How many understand the world is looking for someone to blame whenever something goes wrong? Right. And so they're looking for these groups. They're looking for anyone who gathers together. And church, because we have the mandate to gather together, they were looking at us as the spreaders. They were looking at us as the, as the issue while they were still allowing these other stores and other places to open where all of these things could also happen. But the other thing is security. And when we see the mayor and the Lord Mayor and the, the governor come down on certain issues like that, um, we're focusing on that right now with, um, well, with a couple of different things. Seth, you can well, like, like Michael said, when the emergency powers kick in, you know, I've heard Dr. Gibbs say several times, if there, if you're in California, they're being on the fault. If there's a massive earthquake and just splits, you know, let's just say Los Angeles, splits Los Angeles, we want them to come in and say, okay, you can't go on this road because it's not safe. You can go on this road. This is how you're going to evacuate. This is how you're going to do this and that. And the issue comes in when they want to push. And then once they have those powers, they don't like to leave. They don't like to give them up. Hmm. What have been the, I guess, what, what, kind of, um, what kind of varying views have come out of it within churches that you've seen have um, sadly oh. caused division? Well, witnessing has really dropped. Mm. Witnessing has really dropped. People gathering together to go out and door knocking, people having vacation Bible schools. Any time you would have a group activity that you would normally mm. gather together to do that, not only is the government watching to make sure you're maintaining all the best, but the people are hesitant. The people don't necessarily want to. And it's caused a little bit of a division in our churches because obviously everyone wants everyone to be safe. Obviously. The church is there to love one another, to be kind to each other, to, to help grow together, both in, in spirit and in truth. We want to have that vision together of how to move the church forward. And yet, how can you do that if you won't gather? How can you do that? Um, online is great but it's a spare tire. It is not the full vehicle running. And we found that in America to be true, and I'm sure it is here as yeah. well. Something else he mentioned, the witness. Um, there are businesses that even now, and particularly when it was going on, but there are businesses that even now that would say, you cannot work for our company if you're going to gather in a group like this. Hmm. Um, we dealt with that a lot where you know, they would say, oh, you're in a gathering of over 100, you, you're terminated. Um, mm -hmm. wow. We dealt with a lot of that with businesses. And, you know, I, we didn't have to personally because of what we're dealing with. But, you know, I, I had friends that even they were told, what do I do? They're saying, if I'm in a group of more than 10 people, I can't come to work on Monday. Mm -hmm. Immediate termination. Yeah, people would call our office saying, we have a corporate job and they have shown the light of Christ in their job. They've invited their coworkers to church in the past. Their bosses know they're good workers, they're Christians. And yet, when this all happened, their bosses, as much as they like them, would say, if you're gonna go do that, you can't work here anymore mm -hmm. because you're a danger to everyone here and we just won't allow it. And so we had people call our office in, in droves mm -hmm. over that issue, especially nurses and especially um, those in corporate jobs where they had influence over multiple groups. And there was a double standard. Uh, they specifically targeted churches because we had many people that would call us that said, our business just had a corporate event with 100, 200, however many it was in a building just like this, but they're saying that I can't be at church. How is that fair? was what they were saying, and it's not. <laughs> yeah, and we're still working on churches and working with churches who had to pay fines during this time each time they gathered together of tens of thousands of dollars each meeting. And so over the last two years, each time they met, imagine if the church money that you would think would go towards repair work or towards other outreach programs then has to go towards government fines because you just did what God's called you to do. Mm. And so 
it's severe. They were really trying to, to cause division in the church. They were trying to cause issues with people worrying too much. And um, we just can't fret about the things that God's called us to do. We have to do what he's mandated us to do. Right. And, and that's the thing, you know, moving forward as we, we come out of this, hopefully this time, the, we've seen the ability of governments to sort of step into those areas that have always been sacred. And we've got to be, we've got to have wisdom, don't we? And we've got to be, we've got to be a people that will have the courage at times even to just take a stand for the Lord. And, um, you know, we're living in an ever-changing world, aren't we? And it's just, um, we need to navigate that with God's wisdom and, and really with, with a lot of courage. Um, coming into now just, you know, in the news, obviously, uh, probably all around Western society is the Roe versus Wade. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, would you, one of you explain what that is and why it's so significant? Sure, I'll start. Roe versus Wade around the world has been understood a little bit different than it actually is. In 1973, there was a law that allowed the right to privacy, which was not actually a right given in the US Constitution. It was a made up right, but it caused the allowance of abortion. It caused the allowance of certain things like same-sex marriage, which is in the privacy of your own home. You can't judge someone for that and made provision for later on to have that. Decades later now, after, um, after this last couple of weeks, you've probably seen on the news, there have been some outraged liberal people in the United States over the Supreme Court finally overturning Roe versus Wade and the follow-up case that they actually were following, which was called Casey. In doing so, I want to put to rest, we need to keep praying. This did not stop abortion. This did not end abortion. As much as they want to march and act like that's what happened, there are multiple states, and now it just passed it down to the states in the United States to make it available in their state or not in their state. So their duly elected officials can now say whether it's available in that state or not. So the people actually have more of a right to decide in that state, we will elect people who are for it or we will elect people who are not for it. When the Roe decision came down, it triggered things in the US because there were things called trigger laws in multiple states saying, as soon as they decide this, whether good or bad, this is what's gonna happen in that state. Now in our state of Ohio, which is kind of in the central Midwest of the United States, they had a six week heartbeat bill is what they call in our state. In other states, they are banning it altogether. Mm. But when Roe came down, it was an interesting thing. We actually thought this wasn't how it was going to happen, and our churches were kind of caught flat-footed. Mm. There were three different ways that they could have come down, and they came down with the final one. But the first thing that the, the court could have done is nothing. It could have just left Roe versus Wade exactly how it was. And that's a very common thing with our Supreme Court is they've seen the laws go up, they say it's exactly how it should be, we're gonna leave it alone. The second thing that they usually do, or they could have done in this case, is said, okay, the case that rose to our level, which is out of Mississippi, and the Mississippi State Attorney actually argued the course of the Supreme Court, saying we wanted a 15-week ban, so the baby after 15 weeks cannot be aborted. That was what they were actually arguing before the Supreme Court in the United States. The third thing, which was the actually most radical thing they could do with the conservative balance in the Supreme Court is what they ended up doing, which is using that case to say Roe versus Wade is bad law, Casey is bad law, we're gonna send it back to the states because we believe that this is not something that should be a federal standard. It should be state sponsored. And keep in mind, Roe versus Wade has been highly debated back and forth but as medical technology came out, it simply just dwarfed the understanding of what Roe versus Wade was. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the former Supreme Court Justice, was one of the most liberal ladies on the Supreme Court, and she even admitted that Roe versus Wade was incorrect. Hmm. Um, Michael said, it was astonishing. Uh, I did not think, truthfully, that they were going to say Roe versus Wade and just totally back off. Um, maybe agree with the Mississippi, more likely to leave it where it was. But the fact that they went that way just 
flabbergasted. And it's a, a wonderful praise, mm. um, but it was truly surprising. Mm. But now comes the challenge. No churches were expecting this. No Christians around the country were mm. expecting this. And so what happens now? Now we have, I think the latest count was 20 different businesses in the United States now saying we're going to pay upwards of $4,4800 for our employees to travel to a state that allows abortions, pay for their medical procedure, and pay for their trip back. Hmm. We're seeing just denigration of society, immorality on a scale we've never seen before, and it's being celebrated. Hmm. More than ever, God's people need to stand up and say, this isn't right. Hmm. We can't have this. We need to get out there and, and vote. We need to pray for our country. We need to do that. And that is going to shift into this country. Hmm. What happens in the United States, as Pastor mentioned, just a few years later will be reflected here with the news cycles being international now, with you all seeing what's happening in the US, the outrage there is happening here as well. Yeah. The unrest that's happening there is happening here. The immorality that we're seeing there is happening here too. We've got to pray for our countries. Hmm. We've got to pray for the world. Something else that uh, is going to come up is whether the church is pro-life or we pro-birth. One thing to consider is with these states that are now, you know, with the abortion bans, there's going, very likely going to be an influx of unwanted, I, I don't mean to say that, unlike, uh, un, say that lightly, but there's going to be an influx of unwanted children. Mm. So are, are, is the church going to step up? Are the Christians going to step up and adopt or foster? Um, we were discussing with Brother Gibbs, and he pointed out to us just uh, the other mm. day that said, in the Roman Empire, abortion was widely illegal, but it was not illegal to abandon a child. So often what would happen is they had special places you could go, and they would just take the baby and leave it on the road, and then historically the churches or the Christians would come, take that baby, and then raise them in the church. Mm. So are we at that point where we can mm. do that? That's an interesting um, thought there. I, my wife was, I think, as part of their curriculum in the school, our school, uh, they had to watch a, a documentary called The Dropbox, mm. which is a South Korean pastor. He, he saw a lot of children being abandoned on the on the roads. And so what he did was he, he literally had a box that he would uh, keep out in front of his church. Where, and the argument was, are you enabling that? And you know that, again, just the outrage when someone's trying to do good. Um, and, and we're living in that world now where, where good is vilified, isn't it? Yeah. And standing for life and it is put up against pro-choice, like we're taking away choice in those matters, but actually, is there any choice when it, there comes down to, it comes down to life? And so we, we do, we need to stand for, for what God stands for in that and, and understand that abortion is murder. And, um, and we must, uh, we must uh, look at it in that vantage point. One other thing that is just interesting in the States, if I'm driving down the road and I have a car accident, and the lady who is pregnant, and let's say that it's bad enough that she unfortunately passes, as does the child, there can be a legal action on behalf of both the mother and the unborn child. Mm. The same way in a murder situation, you would have double homicide. Mm. So we recognize it in that sense, but in another sense, we, we don't, and yeah. it's backwards, and it's wrong. Yeah. What are some other things that we're probably going to wind up now? Um, some things that you're seeing just from a governmental point of view as well that, that is becoming an issue for churches. The biggest thing we're seeing right now, and as we mentioned it, we spoke with Brother Gibbs at length on this. We wanted his insight. Um, and we mentioned this to you the other night, Pastor. The biggest thing we're seeing right now is that churches and Christians are being told, and we're getting this case, we're getting these calls every single day multiple times, is that it is illegal against the law to give children the basic gospel message. Hmm. And now let me understand, they're allowing children upwards under the age of six to change their gender now, to choose their gender. They're not allowing parents to have any say in that. 
um, the levels for children having, or I say children because they are, of abortion rights are about 14, 13. They don't have to tell their parents in the United States if they're going to do that. It's sad, but giving a simple gospel message to the child is now being called, you can't threaten children that they won't go to your heaven or face the denigration of deity just because they don't believe what you believe. Mm. Let that sink in. Mm. They want to call it child abuse for you simply to say that to do that is sin and this is the result of sin. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're seeing heavily right now. They're giving children more rights, whereas they're raising the right level of, of different things in the U.S. that you can't have these freedoms unless you're a certain age. And yet for these simple gospel messages, they're saying you can't do that. And we're getting that call. Just a few weeks ago, there were grandparents in our office saying, we've been taking care of our granddaughter because her parents abandoned her and left her with us. And they said, we've been taking her to church. We've been giving her the gospel, praying for her. And she's been going to school. And the counselor at the school called child services on us saying we're abusing her by telling her she can't go to heaven unless she gets saved, unless she has Jesus. Wow. And it's one of the saddest things I've ever heard, and we're getting that call more and more. And I'm sorry to say that that's becoming common. Mm -hmm. Just giving the gospel is not hate speech, it's love speech. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. And I think there's, there's some foundational laws that are placed in several of our states that could lead to that already. And we've got to be aware. Um, if we could, we could close off on this, how, how do we as churches then prepare? Um, with these coming seemingly not if but when, how do we prepare and where's the hope? Well, the hope is in the gospel. Right. Um, myself, I tend to be a little bit laid back, but I have a lot of friends, you know, Roe v. Wade overturned and that kind of stuff. They went out and just attack, 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 attack. I'm not saying it's a bad way, but we need to remember that we are to speak the truth in love. Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes we just get riled up, and rightfully so, but we forget that we need to speak it in love. Mm -hmm. I would say you have to be prepared to stand now for what you believe. In fact, Dr. Gibbs would say you need to have a list, personally and for the church, of non-negotiables. Mm -hmm. That you would say, the Bible says I need to stand for my faith to witness. The Bible says I need to stand to be able to raise my children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, no matter what anyone else says. The Bible says I must do these things, and you need to have a list. As Daniel purposed in his heart, before anything happened to him, he purposed that these are my non-negotiables. And when he asked in the book of Daniel chapter 1, he didn't say, I refuse to do this. He said, May I? He, he asks kindly. Mm -hmm. Because when you ask and when you stand, you have to do it in a way that is not immediately offensive. Because they want the battle. Mm -hmm. The world wants the battle. And we are to love them. And yet we are to stand. And we are to stand firm. Yeah. Not wavering. Mm -hmm. And to have that list ahead of time, I think in my own situation, if I got a knock on the door and said, you know, my daughter I shared in Sunday school in the life group that she just got saved. So I'm thinking about my son now who's going to be five coming up here in September. If they knocked on my door and said, you can no longer tell him that he won't go to heaven or we're going to take him from your house. Hmm. I don't even, I can't even, I can't even fathom the fact that I, you know, that could possibly be in the future. So to have those in place, to know that you're willing to stand, both Michael and I have been in meetings where, you know, the pastor of the church is sitting there and going, if I do this, I may end up in prison. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, you know, you've just watched, you've never thought that just simply for being a pastor and having church that you might end up in prison. And it's a, it's a harrowing moment for sure. That said, let me encourage you, because this is all very, very negative, but uh, it's never been a better time to be a Christian in the world today, because there's never been a clearer definition between light and dark, right. between right and wrong. 
It is so crystal clear now. And so your light will shine brighter now than ever. And so as we stand and as we stand for the things that are right, be encouraged. He that is in us has already overcome the world. Amen. And so let me leave you with that. Yeah, I appreciate that. All right, man, we'll appreciate you. Let's give him a round of applause and appreciate being part of our meetings again. All right, let's see. All right, Brother Paul.